I guess you'd call it a, a, a very intensive sales training seminar about 10 to 12 years ago now. I'm not sure how long it's been, but we've, we've stayed connected and, and remain in contact and try to help each other as we can. Um, we, we reached out to actually, Bill actually reached out to me here about a month and a half ago talking about the, uh, the new statutory trust here. And it was very uh, enlightening to me. So I, I think he's gonna give you a lot of good information. So uh, Bill's a wealth preservation advisor at Actoris, a boutique financial services company here in Denver. Um, after he started his investing career at the age of 10, I'm not sure what he was doing at that point, but it must have done pretty well because he's been doing it for quite some time. Uh, he's worked with clients for the past 14 years, focusing on retirement planning for the unique needs of business owners, affluent families, and real estate investors. Um, throughout each stage, he provides personal attention, a depth of resources, and guidance to support his clients walking side by side with them to build and monitor a comprehensive financial plan. His practice has an emphasis on real estate investing, including private placements, REIT funds, and advising clients on the Delaware Statutory Trust. So today's presentation is focusing on helping realtors to grow their business by being knowledgeable about 1031 exchanges and specifically how the Delaware statutory trusts are being used more frequently by real estate investors as a unique alternative to 1031 exchanges. So um, I'll let Bill go forward. I, I saw this presentation a few weeks ago and I was blown away. I think it could be huge uh, connecting with investors, working with investors and, and helping them through the process. So take it away, Bill. All right. Well, thanks, uh, John, and thanks, Tommy, for uh, helping get all of this uh, logistics and set up. It seems like uh, I think I saw 20 or so, 19 people on here, so that's great. Um, so yeah, let me. I'm going to go pretty quickly here. I am going to take some uh, pauses here and try to get some Q and A going. And I think we've agreed that if you do have a question at some point during the presentation, just unmute it yourself and uh, jump in and interrupt me and um, you know see if I can answer the questions from there. So um, let's just jump in here quickly. Uh, these are uh, important disclaimers that I'll let you uh, read at your leisure. I will highlight uh, the first uh, one on here though. This is for um, accredited investors only. Um, so it's typically people with higher incomes and higher uh, net worth that are eligible for uh, investing in the Delaware Statutory Trust. Um, like all types of security transactions, there's a number of risk factors. So um, investors should definitely be aware of those. And I'm glad to speak with you at an individual level if you want to know more about those. Um, and just as a reminder to John or Tommy, I think my contact information, uh, we're going to, are we going to put that in the chat or is that out there on the Q and A or what, how are you going to do that, John? I can, I can find it and put it in the chat. Um, if you just want me to take it from just some of the email, uh, yeah, that we have. No. Yeah, that's perfect. And the last email that I sent you with that little bit of bio and stuff, there's a, a email and phone number stuff. Um, if anybody has questions after the session's over. Um, so, perfect. all right, so let's just jump in here. So 1031 exchange, um, uh, I think it sounds like a lot of people are, um, you know, have some knowledge of that. It's really a, a sale of one uh real estate property in exchange for another. And there's some uh, nice tax advantages uh, in the 1031 exchange uh, deferral uh, process. This is just uh, a sample property here, uh, happens to be from Brighton, Colorado, that uh, Inland, um, who is the real estate company that we've partnered with, they're the ones that actually do the acquisition of the properties. Um, and put the portfolio together. And I'll explain a little bit more of that uh, later, later on here. Um, so just let me highlight one point on this slide, and that is that a like kind real estate, um, everything qualifies or almost everything except a primary residence. So it can be a business uh, warehouse, investment property, a rental property, um, all of those things qualify 
as a potential property that you could exchange or your clients could exchange into okay. to meet the requirements of a 1031 exchange. Um, so this is uh, this presentation is designed for realtors uh, to help you all uh, have a better understanding of what 1031 exchanges are and how you can educate your clients and uh, may make them aware of some real estate, um, I guess, exchange opportunities that they may not be aware of. And um, again, there is a significant uh, opportunity to potentially defer uh, significant gains. Um, I'm not familiar that much with the Florida market. Uh, however, the Denver market's been quite uh, robust and lots of gains. And I talk to real estate investors uh, every week that have 100, 200, 500, 800,000 uh, dollar gains on properties that they uh, that they have owned for a number of years. And just real quickly, um, the capital gains taxes you know, can be in the 15 to 20% range. So if you've got a $500,000 gain and you get 20% tax, it's $100,000 that you may owe in taxes right off the, right off the bat. Um, and down here, there is mention whenever you do a 1031, there's always a qualified intermediary uh, that escrows the, 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 the funds uh, after the property has been sold and they hold on to those uh, in an escrow until um, the new property is being acquired. And that's a really important point. Um, and let me, let me emphasize this right here. If you have investors or clients that are investing in real estate, uh, when they sell a property, if they're contemplating a 1031 exchange, they must have those proceeds be directed at the closing, go directly to the qualified intermediary. Um, we oftentimes get calls from clients and they say, hey, I just sold a property. I've got the money in my bank account and I'm interested in doing a 1031 or a Delaware uh, statutory trust. Uh, what can we do? Uh, unfortunately, at that point, once they uh, have taken um, ownership or transferred the funds into their own bank account, then the whole 1031 exchange uh, opportunity uh, becomes uh, null and void at that point. So this next uh, slides, I'm going to click through here. Uh, it sort of builds here. It's a hypothetical real estate um, sale. Uh, it shows the leverage of a 1031 exchange. And it basically shows that if you uh, sell a property for a million dollars. If you end up paying the, uh, if the taxes that would be due, um, you, you would only net this $696,000. Um, if you do a 1031 exchange properly, you're going to get the full 1 million and then you would have those funds available for reinvestment. Um, so that's, you know, over $300,000 difference uh, in this simple scenario of, um, of how the 1031 works. Let me take a pause right there and just see if there's anybody wants to jump in here at this point on some of the details of a 1031 exchange. Yeah, Bill, there was a question from uh, Nana, is the qualified intermarry intermediary assigned by title lender or the real estate agent, I've always found it was real estate agent might introduce the qualified intermediary to the client, but the client's the one that chooses that. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. So typically the, what the way it works is that the title company, uh, like we work with, uh, you know, land title here and first American exchange, uh, they have a, a 1031, uh, department in these larger companies. And uh, if you're working with them for the, the closing and the title work, then they're going to uh, connect the, uh, the seller, right, who's ever selling property with the, the department within their, own, uh, within their own company. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. And it is important. Uh, there have been cases in the past where 
Uh, it really, there's not a lot of legal requirements to become a QI. And so anybody can sort of claim that they're a QI, but uh, since if they're, you know, since they're going to hold a large chunk of money, uh, you better make sure you're going with a, uh, a reputable uh, firm. Okay, next slide here. This is where um, basically the three basic steps. Uh, if you're going to utilize the Delaware Statutory Trust, there's basically three steps. Um, you sell the property um, and you can see the proceeds are escrowed with the QI, that's step one. Step two is that the QI um, uh, has a written agreement and uh, holds on to the funds and they would uh, ultimately transfer the funds for the purchase of the uh, replacement property, right? And that might be another rental property or a business property or whatever it is. Um, in the case of a DST, right, or Delaware Statutory Trust, the QI is going to send the money uh, over uh, to the DST company. Uh, and in this case, it would be this uh, inland uh, capital that uh, is one of our partners that we partner with. All right, so three key uh, steps, and, and this talks about, uh, addresses sort of the mo multiple ownership um, in a DST. So let me just jump ahead here and explain this in a little bit more detail. Uh, a lot of real estate folks that I've worked with in the past and different agencies are familiar with TICS, this uh, T-I-C. Um, this is an old structure uh, where you could get uh, 35 investors uh, to basically, um, you know, have a fractional ownership in a single or, or multiple properties. Uh, this tick structure has, has had a number of flaws over the years. And so uh, what we're seeing is that a lot of these group investments or um, maybe a better way to say it, where there's multiple owners and fractional ownership in the trust, um, they're moving towards the, this Delaware statutory trust, uh, uh, basically, concept. It's been around for 19 years. Uh, there's, you know, IRS says it's a, it's a um, legitimate and, uh, you know, perfectly fine type of structure to do a 1031 exchange. Um, and there's less uh, responsibility as an investor with the, the loans and property management details, and I'll talk about that more um, in a bit. So three phases of the uh, Inland DST. Uh, so Inland, uh, let me jump real quick to a slide at the very end, and I'll come back to this one here and just give you a little bit of background on Inland. So if, if you have a client that sells a property, they want to get into this DST structure, they're putting their faith and trust in Inland to basically make good real estate uh, investments and decisions on their behalf. Uh, Inland's been around 50 plus years. Uh, you can see they're the uh, number one um, market share leader in the Delaware Statutory Trust area. Uh, they've acquired and managed seven billion in uh, assets. And you can see the rate of return here on the right-hand side. Um, this is an annualized rate of return from all the way from the beginning uh, to the end. And typically it's a five to seven year hold period. And this is where Inland's going to go out and acquire a portfolio of properties. It could be self storage units. It could be apartments. It could be medical buildings, whatever. Uh, your investor who's doing an exchange would invest in the DST, have a fractional ownership share in it. And, and this is important to, to let me highlight this. Um, they're going to get a monthly check, um, and the payout on these is typically in the five or six percent range, sometimes six and a half percent range. In addition to that, they're going to get the upside. Um, you know, there is risk that there's downside. However, in most cases, there's been upside at the end of the five to seven year period. And um, they would get part of that. And so the combination of the upside of the appreciation at the end, plus the five or 6% during the, the holding period, 
um, Inland has been able to uh, achieve a 8% 8, 8 rate of return on an annualized basis on all of the uh, portfolios that they've had over the years. Um, let me pause here again. There's a lot of numbers and a lot of details and I'm going quickly here. Does anybody have any questions about Inland and anything that I've covered so far or what's on this slide? All right, I'll take that as a not yet and jump back to page 12. So three phases of the Inland DST. So phase one is the Inland uh, uses their own money and capital and uh, sources of debt to go out and acquire uh, properties. And they look across the United States uh, to acquire what they think are strategic um, properties in one particular asset class. So. For example, uh, a couple of the asset classes that they like a lot now are multifamily apartment buildings and self-storage units. So uh, one of the portfolios that they have right now is uh, comprised of 12 self-storage um, uh, properties in the Michigan area. And so that's one portfolio. Um, it might be somewhere in the 50 or $80 million range. And again, if you have a client that is selling a rental house in Florida or Denver or a warehouse in Denver or something, um, and they want to do a 1031 exchange, invest the proceeds in a DST, they would be basically becoming a fractional owner of this, um, of this trust. So the second phase, how did it go from one to three? Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is phase two. So once the, um, the properties have been acquired, uh, Inland takes on full responsibility for uh, managing the properties. And this is huge for a lot of my clients and people that I'm talking to that are you know, maybe in their 50s or 60s or 70s and they've had properties for a lot of years, they've done all the property management themselves and they're just ready to get out of, um, the property management responsibilities, hand it over to someone else, maybe you know, take a little bit of a, a hit on the rate of return that they've been enjoying while they've had the property. However, it allows them to take more you know, vacation, uh, play with the grandkids, enjoy retirement, and just collect the monthly uh, uh, checks in the mailbox and not be getting phone calls um, at you know, inconvenient times. Uh, from tenant-related uh, problems. So the third and final phase at a very high level of these DSTs is that uh, Inland is going to uh, basically look for opportunistic uh, times to sell out of the entire portfolio. So my example before, if it's a self-storage portfolio that they've had in, um, you know, in Michigan, um, a large REIT company or investor may come along and say, hey, we're willing uh, to buy that entire portfolio for you. Uh, Inland will do the analysis, look at the math and say, hey, is this a good return for our investors? And if so, they'll uh, dispose of the property. And then the fractional owners uh, in the trust will get a proportionate uh, share of the, uh, of the upside. So if they had put a million dollars into the DST, um, and maybe there was a 10% appreciation of the uh, whole portfolio over time, they would get their 1.1 million uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, well, at the disposition of the, of the trust. And then at that point, they're in a position to do, you know, basically do another 1031 exchange or they can cash out and pay the tax consequences. So for the sake of time, let me keep sort of flipping through here. Uh, many types of real estate qualify. Um, yeah, anything from uh, duplex, uh, office buildings, condos, uh, all those types of uh, things can be acquired um, as a part of the exchange. And uh, like it says here in the final bullet, virtually any real estate asset other than the primary residence may qualify. Um, and oftentimes people will say, well, if I got a residential, does it have to be another residential that I exchange into? The answer is no, you can 
exchange into different types of commercial real estate assets as well. Okay, tip number three, uh, it's almost never too late to initiate a 1031 exchange. Um, the only disqualifier is that if, if you take or your client takes proceeds and possession of the funds at the closing and puts them in their own bank account, at that point, they're no longer able to do the 1031 exchange. So again, it's important to, uh, for them to work with you and work with the title company and make sure that they're, if they have intentions of doing the 1031, that the qualified intermediary takes possession of the funds. Let me pause here um, and see if there's any questions before I go into a little bit of the, the timeline um, that's required to execute properly a 1031 exchange. So John, Tommy, anybody you want to unmute and ask a question at this point? Yeah, anybody feel free to unmute. Uh, we did have one come in, looks like maybe two now, uh, into the chat. Uh, can a primary residence be sold and use 1031 for an investment property? So primary residence is basically the only one that is not allowed to be used in a 1031 exchange. That's the IRS rules. Okay. And the other question that came in is uh, from Veronica is, is there a time limit to use the funds to purchase another investment property? Oh, that's the perfect question for this slide. Uh, thank you for teeing that up. Um, that wasn't planted, I can assure you. So, um, so here's, the, here's the quick little timeline for 1031 exchange. Uh, day one, you sell your property. Uh, then there's uh, some paperwork that you have to fill out. Um, and that is identifying uh, potential properties that you would acquire and that has to be completed and uh, basically filed with the, the exchange company that's helping you. And that has to be done before day 45. So you might identify multiple properties. That's usually what happens. Um, you say, hey, I'd like to buy property A that's on you know, Main Street and property B is gonna be this other uh, business uh, warehouse that I might acquire. And, and then if you were interested or your client's interested in a DST, they would identify Inland DST as, a, as an alternative property. And I know here in Denver, the way the real estate market is, that people doing these exchanges might identify three properties. And by the time, of, you know, as, as things sort of play out, uh, property A and property B may have already been purchased by somebody else. And so at that point, they may use the DST sort of as a backup or a default that they could move into uh, so that they don't have to, um, uh, you know, take the proceeds and get shut out of doing the 1031 and then have to pay the, the taxes. So, um, yeah, and I think the question really was, when do I have to use the, you know, actually make the purchase? So it's by day 180 that you have to close on the new property to meet the requirements um, laid out by the IRS for a 1031 exchange. So great, great question. Okay, here's lots of details on how the qualified intermediary, what their responsibilities are. They basically take all of the burdens off of you. Um, one of the things that they do um, that we were just talking about here is they monitor the 1031 exchange uh, identification and replacement timelines, right? So identify within 45 days and make sure that the closing of the new property occurs within 180 days. So they help you with that. Hey, Bill, uh, one other question that came in. Uh, can I make multiple purchases or does it all have to go to one purchase or exchange? Yep, great question. Uh, so the answer is you can have multiple uh, questions or multiple properties that you could reinvest. Um, so yeah, if you had a million dollar proceeds um, in proceeds, uh, you could invest that in multiple properties. Um, in fact, um, you guys are amazing how you're teeing these things up here uh, for my next slides. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so this is exactly, if you look at a scenario 
uh, A. So the, the, the term boot, if you're not familiar with it, that is if you're, um, you know, the relinquished property is this $2 million property um, and you're looking, um, you know, at buying a $1 million property, then um, the remaining amount, right, that $200,000 difference, if you don't reinvest that in another property, that's considered boot, and then you would have to, uh, capital gains tax obligations associated with the boot on that property. So in this scenario A, um, you know, this investor has uh, listed a $1.8 million property, and then what they've done so that they can avoid capital gains taxes um, is that they're saying, hey, I can invest $100,000 in this particular DST, um, and oftentimes there's multiple DSTs that you can invest in. So I want to put another hundred into another DST and be diversified there. And so that uh, sort of addresses that $200,000 uh, in boot that you otherwise would have to pay taxes on. Um, so great, great question. I'm gonna skip this one because it's uh, similar to what we just talked about there, just in a little bit more detail. I, I, I better not skip this part about potential commissions for realtors. Anyways, it, it goes into the uh, commissions associated with both sides of the sale, right? The listing of the property that went for sale um, and then on the, the buy side, uh, commissions associated with that. So. Um, yeah, that's real quick how that works. Let me keep clicking so I can get through uh, all of these slides and a couple other key points. Uh, these are some do's and don'ts um, of 1031 exchanges. Your title company will be very, very familiar uh, with these. Um, so, Bill, I've got another question here if you have a yeah. second. Yeah, great. Thanks. I appreciate all this. Is there a time requirement that you have to leave the funds inside of the DST or can it be pulled out whenever a real property is found after investment? Yeah, great question. Again, so uh, typically Inland and the other DST sponsors, the real estate companies that are out there doing these, want um, you to be comfortable with a five to seven year hold period of, of the money being inside the DST or the trust. Okay, if, um, you know, this question comes up almost all the times, if, you know, you're two years into it, you've got your half a million dollars in the trust and you say, oh boy, I'd like to get at it. I need something else or I want to get out or whatever. It's very difficult to get out. Um, Inland does uh, help and that what they will do is they'll say, hey, if you want your 500, we'll go to the other investors that are fractional owners in that particular trust and see if someone wants to buy you out. However, Inland themselves is not obligated to, to liquidate or, or get you out. So sometimes you can get out and other times um, uh, it may be difficult. So again, these are not for everybody. Um, they just, uh, it's really for investors who are able to, um, you know, release the, the uh, um, release the funds and, and have them tied up for five to seven years. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, so benefits to you as a realtor, uh, there's uh, five or six key points here. Um, this is the biggest one. So if you're like me and working with clients that are 50s and 60s and 70s and they're, they don't want uh, management responsibilities for properties, uh, the DST can be a nice uh, alternative that has all the same tax advantages and none of the, the headaches of uh, the day-to-day -day property management. Uh, the other thing I like to highlight is that a lot of the real estate investors that I work with here in the Denver area, they may have five, 10, 20 different uh, residential properties, and they like the idea of getting access to uh, commercial properties or self-storage or apartments or uh, retail places. It's a nice way to diversify um, and it also gets diversification outside of Denver. This happens to be a property, a public grocery store in, uh, in Tampa, Florida, and that's um, uh, an old DST that Inland used to have ownership in. Um, yeah, uh, personal liabilities. There's some um, advantages here on um, 
the loans. Um, what I'm hearing is that sometimes uh, once people are selling a property and they're acquiring a new I think uh, he froze, so we will uh, give him a minute to get back on or unfreeze himself. Give him a minute. How's everybody doing this fine Tuesday? Wonderful. Pretty good, man. You, got, you guys may have already gone Great. over this, but how many of you have done a 1031 before? Me. Yeah, Tommy did a poll. I think the poll might be showing up on your end, Jonathan, if you can see that somewhere. So he just jumped out, so he'll be able to log back in in a second, reshare his screen. Thanks, everybody, for being patient. Yeah, I did a poll in the beginning. Uh, the majority of the responses were uh, familiar with the terms, but haven't really dealt with it much. Um, but yeah. And we had one one response for Go Broncos. So was that, that you, Tommy? Me. Did you put Go Broncos? <laughs> um, well, it's it's interesting. I mean, you hear 1031s, and there are some very savvy investors who utilize that to upgrade. I mean, I know we we've, we've utilized them as a company um, as we've changed offices. Depending on how long you've been with us, you've seen us go from a rental office to a very awkward commercial building in Florida, and then changing that up for another commercial building, which we're in now and just looping in these 1031s to, uh, you know, to benefit in the long run and avoid these big tax obligations. So there's benefits on the investor side, there's benefits on the realtor side, and it's just a great way to continue to build your portfolio. Right, John? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Bill just called me saying he's trying to log back in. So, um, you know, it's funny, one of our agents, the day Bill called me to talk about this, one of our agents actually uh, with COVID and everything, you know, there's eight, 18 investment properties here, and he's literally going into forbearance on 15 of those 18 so he can have cash flow and keep going forward. When I told him about this, he goes, this might be an ideal situation. He can sell off all of his properties, invest it in this, and he can be done being a landlord, which, you know, he, he was building his portfolio, but this way he can keep it going and not have to be the landlord and manage all the properties. So um, I know I, I hear horror stories. He's, he's the property manager for them. And he probably spends 40 hours a week just managing his own personal residence. With these, he can just hand it off to them and they'll take care of it for him. So, Have you have you worked with his company before or seen one of our agents work with uh, with Inland before? I have not. I have not. I, you kind of missed the start. But Bill and I go back to a, uh, a very intensive sales training class we went to. We just stayed in touch. And he reached out to me about uh, two to three months ago sharing this with me. And uh, I thought this would be a good one for us to look into here. But I haven't personally know. Yeah, you never want to be blindsided as a realtor and be asked, are you familiar with 1031s? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I got it. Um, yeah. And you really have no idea because there's a lot of moving pieces. And I mean, yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, impact your contract too much or your disclosure information too much, but you need to kind of be able to guide and structure along the way or provide them with a quality resource. Um, I've always referenced uh, or referred business to asset preventive, asset protection preventative uh, is a big 1031 company across the country. Uh, we have a direct contact there. That's that's always been good. We've had a few go through them. Um, but uh, I'll post the link to their website on here as well. Do it before okay. he gets back. I want to say we've had a couple of, uh, looks like he's calling me back again. We've had a couple of classes here with a couple of the big, big guys here, which have been really perceptive. So. so is he, is he popping in now? I just put the link in the chat box for everyone. This is a company I've personally worked with and we've had agents work with as well um, in case you need a reference for someone else. The chat goes away when he comes back so he won't know I'm referring to somebody else. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, I'm on the phone with him. He said he has no internet there, so I'm not sure if there's anything else we can do with this. Or... Uh oh, um, He can pop it up on his cell phone as well, but the presentation won't be there, but we can guide the presentation from our side since we have it. Did you hear that, Bill? Tommy's going to get the presentation up right now. Yeah, Tommy's going to post the presentation. If you uh, do, we have a number he can call into then. Um, yeah, he can do the call-in instructions. So, give me one sec. I'm going to grab it and then I'll copy and paste it for you. Give me one second. Yeah, we'll figure this out. 
this out for you. There's the call in number. Okay. So here's the number to call it. Whoop. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna have to say this. Uh, let me, I'll just email this to you. Uh, well, let's see here. What's the weather like there in Colorado today? Oh, God, it's beautiful. It's about 80 degrees, low cloud cover. <clears throat> Hey, Jonathan, in like this, the next two hours, right? What's up, Bill? Uh, this API exchange, this is, uh, so you're saying this is an intermediary that you've worked with? Yes. Oh. Yes, and th they've done a few presentations for us over the years here. So if you go onto the education, look for a 1031 class, there's an old one on there. I think the last one was about 18 months ago from them. Okay. Um, but obviously speaking direct to the source is always great. So I love having Bill on here. All right, presentation is up. Tommy, can you find the slide about um, the requirements? Okay, keep going. Stop. Uh, I think this is where he left off. John, is he able to call in? Who's got a closing this week? Let's hear some success stories. I have one on Monday. I looked at your file this morning. It's all looking good. Yeah, man. Excited about it. My first one. Very excited. Who else has a pending deal coming up for closing? Here, let's see. Come on. You guys definitely have deals going on. Let's share some success. I had two last week, and I'm going to have one in two, three weeks. Congrats, Laura. Two under contract this week. You know, we, we all have to just say thank you and 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 be very, very happy of where we are. Uh, it feels like real estate has been the economic anomaly of our entire country. Um, you, you know, some people aren't busy, some people are, um, and there's some that are busier than they were before. Uh, congratulations, Betty, first closing on Thursday. It's exciting. I'm going to do some housekeeping stuff while we're in here. Has everybody signed up for our lead referral partners? Under the resources tab, there are 10 companies that we partner with that you can pull leads from with no upfront cost. It's a percentage if you close a deal. And with that being said, there's one, I don't think it's, Tommy, Prime Street's not Colorado, right? No. So they haven't opened in Colorado yet, but in Florida, Prime Street is a fantastic source uh, we just paid out our first referral to them on a $452,000 deal uh, that closed in the first two weeks of our membership with them. Uh, Op City is always a good resource as well. Thank you, Laura. There's definitely mixed feelings on them. So they can be good in some areas, bad in others. But if you can uh, see the uh, see the clearing, the oasis through the weeds, um, there are some deals to be had in there. Um, yeah, so I think what I've seen on the Op City leads is if they're if they're not in a greater metro area if they're like you said off the beaten path if you focus on those areas you'll get a ton of them. that's i mean laura's probably close eight or nine of them with us and, yeah uh, she they do fantastic up there with that yeah but uh, the ones right in denver i think there's so many agents that are on there it's very tough to get get those leads let alone finish them off so that's the same thing in south florida it's yeah. uh it's tough i mean you think about how many agents we have on there alone i mean you're you're instantly in competition with a lot so right. it's uh, whoever's quicker on the click. So a couple of weeks ago, we did a training on property boost. Laura has Jedi skills. She just wills the approval of the lead. I love it. Uh, <laughs> you will give me that lead. Um, but uh, going back, we talked about some property boost training on KB Core a few weeks ago with Mike, our resident KB Core guru. 
Um, has anyone done a property boost since then? Claudia, you worked on some property boost stuff. I've randomly pulled some just to test different areas and different price points. And um, it's been pretty interesting. So I did a few advertisements on 850, $875,000 listings over the past, past couple of weeks. And I had only one lead come in on either of those. But then I did another one for one of our agents at 1.8 and he got seven leads. So it's really the formula that we work with isn't always the case. And for you to go after these leads at a 45 or a $60 cost for a few days is really worth it. You think about what you're paying for leads and other sources. If you enlisted with a Zillow or a realtor.com, you're paying anywhere from $120 plus per lead that comes in. So if you can gain any contacts and build your book from these property booths and just build the pipeline of people you're reaching out to, even if they're not ready now, um, Laura, you had 50 leads on one property on property boost. That was a property. Wow. Wow. That's in, that's incredible. So, all right, guys, I'm out of fluff. <laughs> I just, I just talked to him. He should be uh, calling in momentarily. And Laura's 50 leads was on a $900,000 property. It just goes to show there is, there is not an exact science. Your pictures, and the optimization of it are just gonna be what drives it. So don't be afraid to throw 45, 60, $100 behind a listing and get it out there. You never know where that one buyer that you need is gonna come from and gives you the chance to double end that deal on your listing. So if you, if you have KB Core, that's a good one to look into. Um, if you didn't notice, they also have an integration now with BombBomb, a free integration where you can use a BombBomb free account through their system and start implementing the video emails and video touches in your campaigns as well. So that's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty neat feature. There's a lot of statistics and tracking on the impact that videos have on the responsiveness of consumers. So that's something neat to look into. All right, looks like we got him in there. I see the Colorado number. So he will be back up here in a second. Can you hear me now? I hit star six to unmute. Is that it? And he's back. Yeah. Welcome. We have your presentation yeah. on the screen. I don't know if you can see it. We're on the page regarding lower personal liability. You tell us if we're there and Tommy will follow along with you. Oh yeah, lower personal liability. Yeah, thanks. We just took out a few more slides here to go. Um, so uh, again, this sort of goes back to some of the financing um, requirements that uh, sometimes associated with getting into a new property. Uh, these DST companies like Inland, uh, they take on uh, some of those liabilities. So you as uh, uh, your client as an individual would, would not have um, those types of uh, liabilities and obligations to come up with the financing because Inland's already taken care of it in the DSTs. Okay. So, so the next slide, um, um, it, 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 this, this is important here. So, so a lot of the folks that I've worked with here in Denver, they have a property they'd like to sell However, they don't know what they're gonna what they're gonna buy into, or they are like, well, everything's overpriced, or it's too competitive, or I don't want to find the right property. Um, and so, making them aware of these Delaware statutory trusts gives them another option of a replacement property or real estate investment that they can roll the proceeds into, right? So, for you as the as the realtor involved in this. If you make them aware that there's other options that they're not uh, that they may not be aware of, this can get you a listing that you otherwise wouldn't get because they're just going to sit on that property saying, "Well, I don't have any good options, so I'm just going to stay where I am and, and not do anything." All right, you guys can hear me. Just give me somebody give me a verbal confirmation. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So, so here's uh, one quick point on the state planning. So. The, the broader part of my business is retirement planning and the state planning, working with you know uh, wealthier clients. 
Um, so what's cool about these DSTs is I've got some clients that are in their 80s that are saying, hey, I've got this real estate property. It's got 500 or a million dollars in gains. Um, what's going to happen when I die? So if they invest, if they do a 1031, put the money into a DST, and two months later they pass away, their heirs are going to get a, what's called a step up in the basis, right? So that means that their heirs, would not have any capital gain tax obligations uh, for that property. So, you know, let's say mom bought the property for a hundred, it's now worth a million. Uh, she does a 1031 exchange, the million goes into a DST. She dies a month or two later after that, and there's three kids. Well, the three kids are then gonna inherit this, uh, this DST and a one third ownership for each kid. And at that point, there's no there's no capital gains taxes that have ever been paid on that property. So it's a nice estate planning tool uh, for some clients. The, the downside of that scenario is that, yeah, uh, mom may have put all this money into a DST and the greedy kids may want to, you know, cash out and buy a new house or a new car or whatever. And most likely, um, you know, they're going to have to hold that DST. However, they will be getting monthly checks. Uh, until the uh, DST sponsor, in this case, Inland, decides to sell out, and it may be a few years down the road. So the next slide is entitled Insurance Policies. Um, I think we've talked about this, and that is if someone's uh, selling a property, they're looking at acquiring another property, um, it's a good idea to consider using DSTs as a backup in case property A and property B um, are, are not available or they get purchased by someone else um, and you really have to meet that 180 day deadline to acquire a new property. So if A and B are gone and you don't have any other properties that you listed on your documentation in that 45 day window, then if you have a DST listed, right, then you could put the proceeds into the DST and again, avoid the um, uh, capital gains taxes that otherwise might come due. All right, we're just about done here. Hey, Bill? Yeah. That, hey, yep, one quick ahead. question. Uh, one of the agents asked, what is the minimum investment to get into a, a CST? Yep, it's typically $50,000. Okay. Can I, can I, while we're stopped asking questions, can I run a scenario that's real time for me and see if this fits in the DST uh, concept? Yeah, I'd love to hear. Okay, so I have, I'm trying to land a listing with a, a townhome here in Wellington and the, <clears throat> what's going to happen, they actually have nine in one, uh, one neighborhood. They have nine townhome properties and I called them there for rent by owner type situation. I called them and I've, you know, they have my paperwork right now to sign for listing, cross my fingers. Uh, but they're going to net about 215, 210, something like that on this property. Um, so, and they don't want to continue getting into, they've inherited these properties. And so they don't want to get into uh, continuing to rent at least certain ones of these properties. So, um, there's a good chance I could present them too. So if they pull out 210, 215, you're saying that they could be protected by taxes if they re if they just invest that in this DST particularly, and that would, you know, that would just kind of keep them from capital gains taxes. I'm just trying to understand all this. That would keep them from capital gains taxes. They would invest for five to seven years in this thing and receive uh, up to 8% back, you know, five to 8%. Do I have all that correct? Yeah, I think everything you laid out there um, is, is correct, um, yes. And they, this could be an option obviously for them. They could just keep on doing that over and over and have, you know, a portfolio that's increasing over the next five to seven years. Yeah, and when you say keep doing it, you're saying with each of these nine townhomes, or just with this one unit that they're getting ten for uh, two ten for. I think I think that could be the first of others potentially is what I'm saying. It could be if if I can yeah. help them create a plan like this, then they may very well want to cross the line with other properties in the future. 
Yeah, no, it makes sense. And um, yeah, we can talk uh, afterwards in more details and, and give you uh, give you some ammunition and some details to show them and uh, you know what they could uh, invest into and, and how they could handle the 1031 so that they wouldn't have to pay any taxes and they're going to get an income stream, you know, a, a check basically every month. And that's on the you know five or six percent annual figure. They're going to get that on a monthly basis, and then at the end of the uh, five to seven year period, um, there's likely to be some appreciation on the overall portfolio, and then they would get the uh, proceeds at the end of that time period as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Good luck with that, and feel free to give me a call if um, if you need some more help and need some more information. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, it looks like we got a couple more in here. Uh, do you have to list a particular DST within that 45 days? Um, and follow up to that, what kind of fees are involved? Yeah, so the particular DST is, yes, you do. In most cases, the, uh, the exchange companies uh, will require it. And so basically we, you know, I can provide that, we can provide that and it might say, you know, DST number one, two, three, which is a uh, multifamily apartments in, uh, you know, in Arizona, for example. So that would get listed uh, with the title company and the exchange department. And then the question about the fee part of it uh, the fee is, I've seen them typically around $800 to $1,000 um, is what the um, exchange company or qualified intermediary um, is charging, at least here in the Colorado area. And I've done uh, one myself, and I think the fee was right around eight or $900. So, um, yeah, I yeah. remember we yeah. had uh, we had another class about 1031 exchanges, and it sounds about what uh, that gentleman said as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then another question: Do they have to have owned the original investment property for a certain amount of time to qualify for the exchange? Well, you guys, somebody might be able to help me. I guess I don't know for sure. Sure. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's any, I mean, you can buy a rental property, you know, for three months and then let's say you get a big gain on it. When you sell it, uh, you can do a 1031 exchange. I, I believe that's the case. I mean, John or someone else that maybe has more experience on that can chime in. No requirement for time owned from what I know. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, can you include uh, foreign property in a DST? Foreign property? Like in a, yes. from a different country? Different country? Right. Um, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Okay. I think the same would go if you're selling a foreign property and trying to reinvest that. I guess that's the question. If a foreigner is selling a local you know, property in the United States and taking the proceeds, can they use those proceeds to go into a DST? Well, yeah, I think the was okay. So that's a different question. I mean, I think if the uh, citizenship um, is more the question than the, the property being foreign. Um, right. Oh, this is part of getting outside of my expertise because I don't know what kind of tax uh, you know, obligations or tax returns they're, you know, filing as a, you know, a foreigner. Or I don't know. We'd have to check with a tax uh, expert there. All righty, no problem. Um, was there any other, do we have any more slides towards the end here that you wanted to go over or anything else kind of getting uh, kind of down to the, the wire here? No, I don't have any more slides. This is the final slide. Um, so I guess in closing, I would just say uh, thanks for all the interest. Lots of great questions. Um, I'd love to have some follow-up conversations with uh, anybody on here that thinks they may have some 
prospects and I can give you more uh, about how we could work together. I am, you know, licensed to work with clients. Um, so I get, you know, I'm licensed to work with clients in virtually uh, any state. Um, and I, I get essentially a finder's fee uh, if I get involved and if we use inland. Um, so uh, that, that's how I'm compensated. So uh, again, thanks everybody. And uh, one, one more question for you before you jump off, Bill. Um, yeah. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, if you own a, a boat, a catamaran, a live-in boat and rent it out for income, can that be considered an asset that you sell and enter into a 1031 for? That's a great question, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, I could find that out by making one phone call. Um, so if who's ever asking that wants to uh, uh, connect with me afterwards, I can check with my resources and uh, get you a definite answer. All right, she, uh, Jenna is going to reach out to you uh, directly to find out that information. Um, Jenna, if you could share that back with us, I would love to know that information myself. That's kind of an off the wall question I had not heard before referencing 1031s. So, um, hey, we all get different perspectives. We all get input from a different place. So really interesting to see these questions. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks for making it so interactive and uh, yeah, if anybody has questions, follow up with me or get a hold of Tommy or John and they know they know how to track me down. Francois, we'll let you know what we hear back on that. Thank you for following up. Bill, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate all the information and the insight. Anybody else have another question? Seeing none, I want to thank you for your time and thank everybody for joining us for another fabulous installment of the Tuesday Mastermind webinars. Uh, Tommy, what is our topic for next week? Uh, still determining what that will be, uh, but we will have it up on the calendars shortly. If there is something that you would like to talk about, that you would like us to go over, that you would like us to highlight and dive further into, we cannot read your mind. Let us know what you would like to learn about, and we are happy to guide you on stuff around that, either in the chat now or feel free to contact us and let us know if there's something you'd like a bigger or more of a deep dive into. And that's what we're here for. We're here to serve you. Red X, Mojo, or others. So you're looking for, Bill, you're looking for uh, lead follow-ups or dialers, uh, review on those programs? Yes, yep, exactly. Actually, it's it's data and dialers. I'm looking for the information uh, and, and the dialing capabilities, mostly the information. Okay. And that's looking for expired listings and for sale by owners? Um, actually, yes, but I'm more interested, I think, in uh, absentee owners here in South Florida and, and also for rent by owners. I've had good success there already. And so, um, you know, just looking for data and easy ways to, I mean, I like those programs that I'm mentioning. But I wondered what you guys think about it and, you know, looking for a little help on, on you know, navigating a good choice on that. Sounds good. Um, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, just shoot an email either to myself, Tommy, or John. We all have access to it. We can forward it out to you. Um, John, I didn't know if you were planning to send out as a blanket, but if you'd like a direct copy, this recording will be up, but you'll also be able to get a copy of the presentation just by asking. We're happy to provide that to you guys. Do the same here. I wasn't going to blanket it to everybody, so. Perfect. All right, guys. Have a productive week, and I look forward to seeing everybody else, uh, everybody later next week. Thanks again, Bill. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Yep. Everybody have a good See one. Go Broncos. <laughs> Go Broncos.